In this video, a summary will be presented of the theory behind uniform and gradually varying flows in addition to computational methods to predict backwater effects in long channels. Further to this, an experimental investigation will be described in a long channel to further understand these flow processes. Backwater effects in gradually varying flows are common in nature, where flow controls, including but not limited to weirs, sluice gates and hydraulic jumps, can influence the water surface profile both upstream and downstream. This schematic gives examples of non-uniform flows. At locations of flow controls, such as weirs, outfalls or hydraulic jumps, the flow velocity and depth vary rapidly and this is defined as rapidly varying flow. Between these flow controls, the water depth and velocity still vary but at a much more gradual rate and we define these regions as gradually varied flow. The gradually varied flow regions can be in either the subcritical or supercritical flow regimes. This video shows the influence of a saltwater intrusion weir on Jeju Island in South Korea. You can see that the subcritical water flow upstream of the weir rapidly transitions to a supercritical flow regime on the weir slope. We can define a rapidly varying flow around the weir crest and a gradually varying flow along most of the weir slope. Before I discuss the experimental investigation, I want to summarise some of the theory around uniform and gradually varying flows. First off, let's define the situation of uniform equilibrium flow. Uniform flow is not common in nature, as it requires straight channels with constant channel slope and shape. The definition of uniform equilibrium open channel flow is where the depth and mean flow velocity do not vary along the length of the open channel. The depth of this flow is defined as the normal depth. The momentum equation can be used to predict the normal depth for a particular flow rate. A control volume can be considered where the inertial forces due to gravity are exactly balanced with the resistive forces due to bed friction. This derivation can be simplified to the calculation shown in the bottom left of this screen. As mentioned, most flows in nature are not uniform flows, and here we reintroduce the concept of gradually varied flow. Regions of gradually varied flow can be seen between flow controls in the schematic we saw earlier in this video. A gradually varied flow can be defined where the flow depth and mean flow velocity vary gradually along the length of the open channel. The backwater equation can be derived to help describe gradually varied flow and is defined along a streamline in the S direction where S is the direction along the open channel in the direction of flow. Firstly, I will introduce the mean specific energy E, which is equal to the mean total head H minus the bed elevation Z0. The rate of change of the mean specific energy with respect to S is defined as the bed slope minus the friction slope. A rearrangement of these equations gives the backwater equation, as highlighted in red. Here, the rate and change of the mean total head h with s is equal to the negative of a friction slope. These equations are derived assuming that 1. The flow condition is non-uniform flow, 2. A steady flow condition, 3. The flow is gradually varied, i.e. it is not rapidly varied such as a hydraulic jump, and 4. At a given section, the flow resistance is the same as for a uniform flow for the same depth and discharge, regardless of trends in the depth. This final assumption means that we can define the friction slope using the equation at the bottom of the screen in terms of the Darcy friction factor, F, which was originally derived for uniform equilibrium flows. In practice, applying the backwater equation often requires a numerical solution. Here I will introduce the standard step method, which will be used later to predict the water surface in the experimental investigation. We can return to the differential equations expressed in the previous slide, this time expressing the rate of change of the mean specific energy with respect to S in terms of a small finite increment, delta S. 
This allows us to derive numerically a new equation that relates the mean total head at two different locations, separated by the distance delta s. With knowledge of the mean total head at a starting location, which we call a boundary condition, this equation can then be calculated repeatedly to determine the flow conditions at different spatial locations along the channel. The mean total head is also approximated at the bottom of the screen, assuming a hydrostatic pressure gradient. Alpha, the Coriolis coefficient, can be taken as one for the purpose of these experiments. Now I will describe the experimental investigation to investigate backwater effects in a long channel. The experimental procedure will include taking observations and measurements of flow conditions for uniform and non-uniform flows, which can then be compared against calculated predictions and the results of numerical modelling. The long channel, visible here from the hydraulics lab at the University of Queensland, is a 12 metre long, 0.5 metre wide channel, with a constant bed slope of 0.028. An intermediate movable sluice gate is present near the middle of the channel, in addition to a radial gate at the downstream end. Both gates will initially be set open in the experiments. Water depths will be measured throughout the experiment using a pointer gauge which can be traversed along the channel. The pointer gauge should read zero on the channel bed. Where unsteady surface perturbations mean the water surface is not constant, the average surface water level at that point should be recorded. The first step is to set the flow rate to between 25 to 30 litres per second using the flow gauge located at the upstream end of the channel, depicted here. A constant headwater reservoir is located at roof level and the flow of water from that reservoir into the channel is controlled by the flow gauge. Using the manometer and delta H to Q calibration chart, the flow discharge rate can be determined. Once the flow discharge rate has been set, both gates should be left open and the flow in the channel will look similar to the flow in this video. Here, a transition exists between a subcritical flow immediately adjacent to the flow gauge and manometer, which gradually varies along the channel until it reaches a uniform equilibrium flow where the water depth no longer varies. In this example, the uniform flow is in the supercritical flow regime. Step two of the experiment is to find and measure, using the pointer gauge, the critical and normal flow depths, which can be compared later with the predicted depths. As we have an upstream subcritical flow regime next to the flow gauge, transitioning into a supercritical flow in the channel, we know that the critical flow depth will be located at some point within that transition, which is at the upstream end of the channel. In this experiment, it may be difficult to precisely locate this location, but we can make a good attempt by estimating the critical depth to be around the point where water surface disturbances begin to occur. For supercritical flow, the normal depth is best estimated near the downstream end of the channel. Once the flow has undergone the gradually varied flow transition to its equilibrium state. Note that this would not be necessarily the case if the flow was in the subcritical regime. When measuring the flow depth, it should be checked that water depth does not vary spatially in the channel adjacent to the measurement location. Step 3 of the experiment involves applying the hydraulic controls, namely the intermediate sluice gate and the downstream radial gate, to investigate the backwater effects. When the intermediate gate is lowered, causing a partial blockage of the flow, an immediate effect can be seen to the flow regime. A hydraulic jump immediately forms on the upstream side of the gate and propagates upstream through the channel with time, before reaching a steady location. Note that this stabilisation process can take some time. And in this example, takes around three minutes. A similar process can be observed when the radial gate is lowered. Note also that the final location of the hydraulic jump is very sensitive to the radial gate opening size.
Whilst the location of the hydraulic jump is changing, it can be considered to have a surge velocity which corresponds to the velocity at which the location of the hydraulic jump moves. This is the same in principle to surge waves or tidal bores which result from sudden changes in flow, such as the partial closure of a gate or a quick change of the tide. As such, an analogy can be made between the propagating hydraulic jump in our experiments and this observation of a tidal bore in the Kayantang River in East China. Tidal bores can have a large impact on the surrounding environment, causing large levels of sediment transportation and providing unique estuarine zones for wildlife. However, these tidal bores can also be life-threatening. The tidal bore observed here is approximately 2 metres high. Now that the flow gates have been partially closed and the hydraulic jumps have stabilised in a steady location, we can start step 4 of the experiment. Using the pointer gauge, the water depth should be recorded every half metre along the entire length of the channel. A tape measure running along the top edge of the channel will aid in measuring the longitudinal distance. When taking these measurements, you should record the locations of any flow controls present at or near the measurement location, in addition to observations of the flow patterns present, such as whether the flow is gradually or rapidly varying, or in the subcritical or supercritical flow regime. It is also worth noting the positions of the hydraulic jumps and observed type of jump. Shown here is a video of the flow conditions around the intermediate sluice gate. Immediately upstream of the gate, a subcritical flow regime can be seen, although some unsteady surface perturbations may cause some inaccuracy in water level measurements in this region. A short region of rapidly varying flow follows as the water flows under the sluice gate, with supercritical flow clearly visible immediately downstream. With close inspection of this region of supercritical flow, it can be seen that the flow depth varies along the channel demonstrating gradually varied flow. Note also that some leakage can be seen around the edges of the intermediate sluice gate, which may have some influence on the flow when comparing measurements with predicted water surface heights. The downstream radial gate is also partially closed, and as such has imposed a subcritical flow upstream of that gate in a similar fashion to the intermediate gate seen here. This prompts a hydraulic jump to occur between the two gates to transition the supercritical flow back into the subcritical flow regime. Another hydraulic jump can also be seen upstream of the intermediate gate as the flow transitions from supercritical to subcritical flow. When the hydraulic jump is relatively close to the gate, the unsteady surface perturbations will present a clear limitation in accurately measuring the water depth immediately upstream of the gate. The location of this stable hydraulic jump is very sensitive to the size of the gate opening, where a change in the opening in the order of millimetres may move the location of the hydraulic jump in the order of metres. Once measurements of the water depth have been completed along the entire channel, we can begin step 5 of the experiment. This involves undertaking the backwater computations using the standard step method to estimate water depths in regions of gradually varying flow, which can then be compared with the measured values. You will be provided with a template spreadsheet that implements the standard step method to compute the water depths for each region of gradually varied flow separately, with the different regions separated by the flow controls, such as the hydraulic jumps and gates, over which the backwater equation does not apply. Required inputs are flow parameters recorded during the experiment, in addition to boundary conditions for each calculation region. The boundary condition consists of a location and measured water depth that must be inputted at either the upstream or downstream boundary for each calculated region. Determining whether to use an upstream or downstream boundary depends on the flow regime present. For subcritical flow, 
the boundary condition should be entered at the downstream end, and for supercritical flow, the boundary condition should be entered at the upstream end. Once you have inputted the flow parameters, boundary conditions and measured flow depths into the spreadsheet, a graphical output will be created similar to that seen here, which compares the computed and measured water depth values. Note the physical meanings of the different curves present on the graphical output. These include the predicted and measured water depths, in addition to the critical, normal and conjugate flow depth for reference. Note that the conjugate flow depth was defined earlier in the semester as the sequent depths with respect to one another on either side of a hydraulic jump, as derived using the continuity and momentum equations. Following completion of the experimental measurements and calculations requested in the lab report, there are various points of discussion to consider. Within the lab report, you will be asked to compute the water depths immediately upstream of each gate based on the continuity and Bernoulli principles, based on a known flow rate and gate opening. How does this calculation compare to the measured values upstream of the gates? When comparing the values, it is worth considering both the assumptions utilised in the calculations, such as neglecting energy losses or the definition of a contraction coefficient in addition to a consideration of experimental errors associated with flow leakage, measurement error, and so on. It should also be considered how the occurrence and location of a hydraulic jump may be predicted. We can recall that when a gate was partially closed in the experiment, it imposed a subcritical flow immediately upstream of the gate and a supercritical flow immediately downstream of the gate. If sequential gates are present, why might a hydraulic jump be necessary? Referring to the backwater computation spreadsheet graphical output, by comparing the conjugate water depth curve computed using the computed supercritical flow depths with the computed subcritical flow depth curves, how might these curves be useful in predicting the location of a hydraulic jump? Finally, a comparison of the computed backwater surface profiles with the measured depths along the channel is requested, and similarities or differences should be discussed. There are various potential sources of error that could be of interest when using the backwater computations. Some are associated with the experimental procedure itself, such as errors in the water level measurements, which may in turn affect the accuracy of the boundary conditions. Also important are the assumptions made in the calculation process and potential numerical errors. There are numerous inherent assumptions included within the estimation of the friction slope, including the estimation of the Darcy friction factor and assumption of hydrostatic pressure. Further numerical errors can sometimes be significant if the step size is too large. Would the calculations match the recorded measurements better if a smaller step size was utilised.